automatically. Um, yeah. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. My name is Maddie Carlson. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Engagement and Events Assistant with the Street Trust. Before we begin our program, the Street Trust would like to acknowledge the land we are occupying. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. Thank you. Welcome to the Legal Clinic for Youth. Your presenter for this session is Chris Thomas. You can type questions in the chat or use the raise hand tool, both found at the bottom of your screen. Please use the social media hashtag Oats21 to post about the summit on social media. And don't forget to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about our other programs and activities, including SB 395, AKA Safe Routes for All, an update to the historic bike bill on its 50th anniversary that the Street Trust is championing in the Oregon legislature this session. Now, without further delay, please welcome to your screen, Chris Thomas. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Chris Thomas and I am an attorney at Thomas Kuhn, Newton and Frost. And uh, we're a Portland law firm uh, established in 1980 that um, represents uh, injured people in all kinds of different uh, areas, um, including uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. And um, we have a long uh, history of working with the Street Trust, which was formerly known as the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, to um, help uh, spread the word about what um, people's rights and responsibilities are on Oregon's roadways um, when uh, biking and walking and driving. Um, and uh, these clinics are a big part of that effort. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing them um, since the early 90s. And a lot of uh, Portland and Oregon uh, statewide uh, folks have come to our clinics uh, and um, heard us um, talk about uh, the laws that apply to, to bike riders and people walking and driving and, um, and asked uh, questions uh, about different situations. And um, we hope that you all will find it um, helpful and uh, that you'll feel free to uh, write questions in the chat box or um, in the Q&A uh, and uh, feel free to, to ask questions at any point and I'll, I'll try and uh, answer them as, as well as I can. Um, so I'm going to um, share my screen here. So again, this is me. I'm, I'm Chris Thomas, and um, we've got uh, a couple of websites listed here. Um, one is our, our law firm's uh, main site, and another is OregonBikeLaw.com, which is where we um, keep a lot of uh, written materials about bicycle law, uh, e-bike law, pedestrian law, um, and uh, e-scooter law. Uh, we've got uh, resource guides on all of those areas. And so uh, I would encourage you to check out uh, those resources at Oregon Bike Law um, if you are interested. So I like to think about the importance of knowing the law at the outset of um, our, our discussion, um, because we all know that it's helpful to know the law because if uh, you know, a police officer uh, sees that you're violating the law, that um, that's not good. You could get a ticket uh, or something like that. Um, but another uh, reason that it's really important to know what the law is, um, is that if uh, an accident happens, um, a collision between road users, uh, a lot of times what the people do in the aftermath to try to figure out who's at fault is to look at the applicable laws and see uh, whether they were being followed. And so it's really important when you're out there moving around to know what laws apply to you. Um, because if 
uh, you're unlucky enough to have something, something bad happen where a crash happens, um, the law will be the reference point uh, a lot of times to see uh, who's at fault. So one sort of overarching principle um, that applies to bikes in, in Oregon law is that um, they're treated as vehicles. And so when you um, flip through the vehicle code, um, as I'm sure uh, most of you uh, haven't done, maybe when you were studying for the uh, driver's test, but um, what you'll find is uh, that there's a whole bunch of laws known as the Oregon Vehicle Code that apply to vehicles generally. You know, you got to follow the speed limit. You got to stop at stop signs. Um, use your turn signal. Um, those are all laws that um, apply to bicycles too um, under this uh, statute, um, which says that um, bicycles are subject to vehicle laws. Um, and the statute is ORS 814.400. ORS means Oregon Revised Statute. Um, and um, you can find all these statutes in the legal guides that I referenced earlier um, on our website. Um, or you, there's a, a comprehensive uh, statute website for, for Oregon law. Um, so bikes are treated as vehicles unless one of these two exceptions applies. Um, and laws that by their very nature can have no application, um, those don't apply. So um, I actually just mentioned that you got to use turn signals if you're operating a vehicle, but uh, bikes don't have turn signals uh, usually. And so you're not obligated to engage a, a flashing turn signal as you would uh, in a car on a bike. Um, another example of that is vehicle emissions. Uh, bikes don't emit uh, pollutants. And um, so you're not required to, to take them over to DEQ and have them tested. Um, another exception is when a statute specifically says that it doesn't apply to bikes. So sometimes you'll see a statute that actually says explicitly in the text, it doesn't apply to bikes. And so it doesn't. A couple of examples of this. Um, so in Oregon, there's a, a statute that uh, says you can't operate um, a vehicle under the influence of intoxicants. It's known as a DUI. And um, the way it's written, is that a person commits the offense of DUI if they drive a vehicle while intoxicated. Um, and it doesn't say except bicycles and it doesn't say it's gotta be a motor vehicle. And so the law in Oregon is that if you ride a bicycle while you're under the influence, you can get uh, cited for this uh, violation. And um, it's the same level of DUI as if you were driving around in a two ton car um, even though on your bike, there's a much lower capacity to cause damage to others. A um, couple other examples. Um, there's uh, an impeding driving statute, um, ORS 811.130. And it says, a person commits the offense of impeding traffic if the person drives a motor vehicle in a manner that impedes or blocks the movement of traffic. And this one, you might think, well, it says motor vehicle and bicycles aren't motor vehicles. Um, and so uh, the statute, uh, the exception should apply that says that bikes are not subject to this statute. Um, we, we go back to the exceptions. Uh, and when, when, a, when, a, when a law specifically provides that it doesn't apply to bikes, then it doesn't apply. Um, but even though this statute says it applies to motor vehicles, um, this was actually uh, an issue that was heard by uh, the Oregon Court of Appeals, uh, which is the Oregon, uh, it's just a court just below the Supreme Court uh, that decides uh, legal issues um, when uh, there's uh, someone who appeals a decision. And what happened here was um, there was a critical mass ride that um, is a, was a, a group ride that was, uh, happened, I don't know, uh, at least 10 years ago, where a big group of people um, rode their bikes across the Hawthorne Bridge 
Um, and uh, the, the police actually issued a ticket to one of the riders for um, impeding traffic, um, for riding in the lane on the Hawthorne Bridge. And the guy who got the ticket said, hang on, uh, this statute says uh, motor vehicle. And I was riding a bike. I didn't have a motor on my bike. And uh, so he got, got the ticket. He got it convicted at the trial court. He appealed it to the court of appeals. And the court of appeals said, um, even though the statute says motor vehicle, it still applies to you um, on your bike. And so just because the statute uh, contains the term motor vehicle doesn't mean that bikes are excluded necessarily, um, which is a little counterintuitive. Um, and uh, so another statute that you know, might apply to bikes under that uh, logic is the distracted driving statute. This fellow's texting while riding his, his fixed gear, looks like. Um, and you know, when you read the distract, distracted driving statute, it says a person commits the offense of driving a motor vehicle while distracted. Um, and so it's, it's in terms of a motor vehicle. Um, but as we learned in that case I just mentioned, um, the term motor vehicle is not enough to exclude that. So this, this has a lot of consequences for, um, for what, what uh, bicyclists understand as which statutes apply to them or not. And it makes it a little less clear than it could be. Um, so just sort of uh, some basic statutes that govern what kind of equipment you're supposed to have on your bike. Um, so uh, in limited visibility conditions, um, you are required to have a front white light and a rear red reflector or light. Uh, and this is at night um, or when a vehicle is not visible from a thousand feet away. Um, a lot of people don't realize that you can satisfy the statute just by having a rear red reflector, not a rear red light. Um, and uh, many people go above and beyond what the statute requires and use a rear red light as a best practice. But the statute only requires a reflector. Um, helmets are required for riders or passengers uh, under the age of 16. Um, they're also required for all e-scooter riders, regardless of age. Uh, brakes are required to be able to stop a bike. It's very specific. Uh, uh, in 15 feet from 10 miles an hour. And that's usually pretty easy to accomplish. Um, and uh, you might try just doing a little test and see if your bikes comply with that, but um, they should unless there's something loose with the cables or something like that. Um, one sort of interesting application of these equipment statutes is um, with respect to fixed gear bikes. And um, these uh, have kind of uh, had periods of being more popular, um, certainly in the last uh, 15, 10 or 15 years, but um, these are bikes that do not have uh, free wheels, so you can't coast. So as long as the wheels are moving, you're pedaling. And um, if you wanted to, and a lot of people uh, who ride fixed gears uh, like to slow down and stop by using reverse pressure on their pedals, um, like you would uh, if you were a kid riding a big wheel, uh, to slow down the bike, as opposed to um, having the bike be equipped with a, a handbrake that you squeeze. And so um, in Portland, what happened was a police officer actually issued a ticket to a bike rider for riding a fixie um, that didn't have a conventional handbrake. And the fixed gear rider said, hang on, I can stop using my legs in, um, in 10 feet or in 15 feet from 10 miles an hour. And uh, the judge said, no, the statute says you got to have a brake. And I interpret that to mean um, a handbrake that you squeeze. And so um, you got to be careful if you're riding around in your, um, on your fixed gear or on your big wheel uh, that you got um, a way to stop um, that's considered a, a conventional brake, at least according to some police officers. Okay. 
So um, moving on from equipment to the um, rules governing how we move around on the roadway. Um, the one that um, I'd like to start with is um, the rules surrounding yielding to riders in a bike lane. And the reason is that um, a whole lot of the cases that we see uh, involve drivers failing to um, yield to riders in bike lanes as required by Oregon law. So um, ORS 811.050 is entitled failure to yield to riders in bike lane. And what it, it's pretty clear um, before a driver turns across a bike lane, um, they're required to look make sure that there's no rider approaching. And if there is, yield the right of way to that rider and let them clear through before turning. Um, this is a little bit of a tough concept for a lot of drivers. Um, you know, usually if you're driving on a road and there's no bike lane, um, if you uh, are able to turn right, there's not a through lane to your right that turning across. So you can usually be confident that you're not going to cut somebody off if you're turning right when you're allowed to. Um, but bike lanes, of course, you can, you're allowed to continue through the intersection using them. And um, a lot of drivers just do not have the training um, or um, the understanding of uh, what the law is. Um, and what, so, what one study has found is that um, if you look at what drivers look at when, before they turn across a bike lane, at least half of drivers in that study did not look for bike riders approaching. And so um, many of us who spend a lot of time riding bike lanes know this to be true and ride very defensively at places where drivers might turn across the bike lane, which is not the most um, stress-free way to, to ride, but um, it's important to be defensive. Okay, um, another statute about bike lanes is that if you're riding on a street where there is one, uh, you're supposed to use it unless an exception applies. And um, the exceptions are if you're passing another bike or there's a car parked in the bike lane, you can go around it. Um, if there's like debris, like um, leaves or snow in the bike lane, you can, you can leave the bike lane for that. Uh, or if you're getting ready to make a turn and you've got to leave the bike lane to do that, of course you can't. Um, but otherwise, uh, you've got to use the bike lane if it's there, which can be a little bit frustrating. Um, if, uh, for example, on this street, um, this is downtown uh, on Second Avenue. And there is a bike lane on the far left side of the street behind a row of parked cars. And part of the issue that I have with this bike lane is that um, because it's hidden behind those cars, uh, a lot of people driving don't realize it's there. And so they um, oftentimes turn across it without looking. And also you end up sometimes having people uh, walking who don't realize it's there and walk across it to get to their cars or across the street. And um, on this stretch of downtown, usually vehicle traffic's pretty slow. And so on a bike, you can usually pretty easily keep up with the car traffic in the, in the vehicle lanes. Um, but despite all of that, despite, you know, how you might feel about a bike lane, if it's on that road, you've got to use it unless um, one of these exceptions applies. So if you're riding on a road and there isn't a bike lane, um, here's the rule. You've got to ride as far to the right as practical, unless an exception applies. Um, I think the, big, the biggest exception is that if you are um, not impeding traffic, you can take the lane. So if, if there's no traffic on that road, or if um, traffic is going uh, slow enough that you're not impeding it, then you can feel free to take the lane. And actually you can take the lane with a buddy riding side by side with you. You can ride two abreast. Um, another exception from needing to ride as far to the right as practical is if um, you are encountering, you know, 
other bikes on the road, you need to pass them. Uh, if there's debris on the shoulder, you can go around it. Um, or if you're on a one-way street, then you can actually ride as far to the right or as far to the left as practical. Um, but, you know, a lot of times if you're on like a neighborhood greenway on the east side of Portland where there's not much traffic, uh, you can feel pretty comfortable in taking the lane because you're not uh, impeding any traffic. And um, there's, there's another exception to this that I haven't listed here, but if there's if there's not an opportunity for um, a, a vehicle to safely pass a bicyclist, given the width of the roadway, you're also entitled to take the lane in that instance. So this is a, a ORS 814.430 um, gives bicyclists a lot of rights to the lane and some people call it the bicycle bill of rights. And uh, I'd encourage you to take a closer look at that statute if you wanna see some more of the details. Okay, sidewalk riding. Um, you know, I've got three little kids and uh, when I'm riding around town with them in my cargo bike or with, th with them on their own bikes, um, there are oftentimes situations where I'd rather be on the sidewalk uh, on like a busier street um, just to stay out of the street and not have to worry about cars as much. Um, particularly if you're riding near a busier street like, uh, you know, Northeast Broadway or MLK or any number of uh, the high speed arterial streets that we've got in our city. So the general rule is that you are allowed to ride on the sidewalk statewide unless it's prohibited by a local ordinance. And most cities, including Portland, have an ordinance that says that you can't ride on the sidewalk in a certain downtown core area, which is defined as between NATO and 13th and Hoyt and Jefferson. Um, if you're in that area, you can't ride on the sidewalk. If you're outside of that area, uh, you can, as long as you comply with the rules that are set forth in um, this statute. Uh, ORS 814.410. Um, and what it says is that uh, you got to always yield the right of way to people walking. Um, you've got to give an audible warning before passing people walking, which can be uh, your voice. It can be a bell. Um, I've got a bike with a really loud freewheel when I coast. You can hear me from pretty far away that might qualify. Um, and here's a big one. Before you ride your bike across a driveway or into a crosswalk, you're required from the sidewalk, you're required to slow to a walking speed. Um, and this is one that we see sometimes violated by people riding who are understandably trying to get somewhere um, by riding on the sidewalk and don't slow down before they enter a crosswalk or cross a driveway and get hit. And there's this statute that says that they're supposed to slow down. And it, um, like I said at the beginning, it can cause liability uh, issues when that happens. Um, so good practice is to slow down at all driveways and at all crosswalks if you ride on the sidewalk. Um, I put no electric bikes here. So electric bikes are not allowed to be ridden on the sidewalk um, anywhere in Oregon. Same goes for electric scooters. So when I, ro when I roll up on the sidewalk to drop my kid off for kindergarten, um, my electric cargo bike, uh, that's a technical violation of, of this statute. Although it wouldn't be if I were riding a, a non-electric cargo bike. So I like to use this as an example. This is my, one of my favorite rides to do in the whole city. It's a um, Kelly Point uh, Loop, which is a loop that goes out to Kelly Point Park at the confluence of the Willamette and the Columbia Rivers in North Portland. And it's a nice flat loop that's off the big part of it's car free. You can see the path here. A lot of the um, 
route is like this, uh, where you've got a path that's separated from the road. And um, legally, you might think that this path would be defined as like a multi-use path or a bike path or um, maybe even a bike lane. But um, this path most neatly falls within the definition of a sidewalk. Um, and so uh, what that means is when you ride on this path, even though you might feel like you're riding um, on a designated bike facility where you can kind of stretch your legs a little bit, um, under Oregon law, it's, it's a sidewalk. And when you cross driveways, like the one shown here, or enter crosswalks, um, of which there are some, it's important that you slow down um, and look for cross traffic and uh, enter at a walking speed, which um, is not intuitive based on how the infrastructure feels when you're using it. So I always like to point that out. Okay. Um, another thing about crosswalks. So um, crosswalks are um, important to understand legally because when we navigate through a city on our bikes or on foot, um, if we're uh, riding our bike on the sidewalk or walking on the sidewalk, um, you know, a crosswalk is uh, an, an opportunity, it's a potential conflict area. Um, and when you're driving, it's the same, same thing. You really need to understand crosswalk law so that you can make sure that you're avoiding the potential conflict that can happen at intersections. Um, the rule in Oregon is that every corner is a crosswalk. And so what that means is that even if there is not um, any marking on the, on the pavement um, that would indicate a crosswalk, there is what we call unmarked crosswalks at every single um, unmarked intersection that gives uh, the person crossing there the right of way as long as they um, establish their intent to proceed. And so, for example, you know, at, at any number of side streets um, on the east side of Portland, uh, there are oftentimes not any markings. Uh, on the pavement at all. But at all of those corners, there are legal crosswalks known as unmarked crosswalks, where if you give your intent to proceed, then cross traffic, people in cars and on bikes in the road must stop and yield to you. And the way that you establish your intent is by putting your foot or your front bike wheel or your cane or your dog or whatever extension of you you've got into the roadway. Um, onto the roadway surface. Um, you can't suddenly leave the curb and move into the path of a vehicle that's coming at you. It doesn't have time to stop. Um, you got to give them an opportunity to slow down and stop. But once you establish your intent to cross, uh, drivers are required to slow down and stop for you. So this is one example. Um, this is Northeast Broadway. And it's a big wide street um, with a whole lot of traffic on it. And um, it's next to a residential neighborhood where people are often walking. And at, these, at this crossing, um, there is no uh, crosswalk painted on the pavement. There's no traffic light, um, but nevertheless, there is a unmarked crosswalk here that connects the curb on the right to the curb on the left. Actually, there are four unmarked crosswalks in this picture connecting all the corners. And this fellow who I stumbled upon while cruising Google Maps for an example of um, somebody trying to use an unmarked crosswalk is standing out in the roadway, clearly has the intent to proceed across the street. And yet um, the Google Maps a uh, camera vehicle does not stop for him and neither do a bunch of other vehicles. Um, even though uh, he's out there trying to exercise his rights and they're legally obligated to slow down and stop for him. So this is one of those laws that is on the books that is um, unfortunately not 
um, widely complied with, um, a lot of which I think has to do with uh, just a lack of understanding of what the legal rights are. Um, and it's quite frustrating when you are familiar with this law and you um, try to exercise it as a pedestrian crossing a busy street when um, you have to uh, deal with a lot of people who fail to comply with it. Uh, here's a, another uh, application of this principle. This is uh, an intersection uh, where you've got a busy street, um, Killingsworth, being crossed by a neighborhood greenway, 37th, in Northeast Portland. And as you can see, there are uh, some marked crosswalks across 37th here, um, which, you know, we know how uh, crosswalks work. If you establish your intent to proceed in that uh, crosswalk, cars have to slow down and stop for you. Um, but what about, so if, if, you, if you look closely, next to these white stripes uh, that show the crosswalk are green stripes. And the green stripes are a uh, feature known as cross bikes. And you see them at a whole bunch of crossings. And those are um, designed to kind of look like crosswalks. Um, but very importantly, they are not part of the crosswalk. They are um, actually, unlike a crosswalk, they don't give you any additional legal protection. So if you're in a crosswalk crossing the street, uh, you're entitled to the right of way. If you move into this area with the green um, stripes, then you don't have the right of way. Um, you actually are subject to the stop sign over here on the left um, because you're out in the roadway. And so, um, you know, these, these uh, cross bikes, as they're called, are well intentioned, designed to. Um, highlight the presence of bicyclists at these crossings, but legally um, they're meaningless. And um, we always are concerned that um, the uh, misunderstanding about whether these cross bikes give people rights could lead to a collision. And I've actually, um, I've actually been crossing a street just like this uh, in the cross bike on my bike uh, actually just kind of waiting for traffic to clear. And one of the drivers on the busy street thought that they were required to stop for me when they weren't. And they slammed on their brakes and they almost got rear-ended. Uh, the car behind them skidded to a stop inches from their bumper. Um, and the car that stopped for me didn't have to stop. They were uh, either really polite or confused about what the law was. And I was thankful that they were so, um, you know, uh, polite to me um, by letting me cross. But I was also a little bit concerned that um, this was, this, amb this legal ambiguity could have caused a wreck. Um, Idaho Stop, this is a, a recently passed law that went into effect in uh, January 1st, 2020. And what it says is that, um, if you are riding your bike toward a stop sign, then, uh, and, and cross traffic is not approaching and the intersection is clear and there aren't any pedestrians trying to cross, then rather than come to a complete stop, you can, come, you can slow to a safe speed and roll through the stop sign without stopping. And uh, this is pretty important for people who ride bikes. Um, especially on side streets where there's a whole bunch of stop signs uh, to get through town efficiently. Um, because in a lot of the places where I feel safest riding, um, there tend to be more stop signs and it can be pretty tough to want to slow down and stop at every single corner, especially when you can tell pretty clearly that there's no cross traffic. Um, and so this is a great, a great law that allows you to to roll a little more efficiently. Of course, if there is cross traffic or there are pedestrians trying to cross, then you got to come to a complete stop uh, just like normal. 
But if there's not, you can, you can slow to a safe speed and roll through it. It's called the Idaho stop because it's been in Idaho um, for quite a while as the, the law of the land. And in Oregon, uh, there were several efforts to get it passed. Um, and finally, a couple of years ago, they were able to do it. Um, signaling. So when you're riding your bike um, and you're getting ready to turn or stop, the Oregon law requires that you um, use your hands to signal your intention to turn or stop for 100 feet before doing so. And you can do that by pointing right or left uh, the direction you intend to turn. Um, you can also indicate your intention to turn right by putting your left hand up. And um, you can indicate your intention to stop by putting your left hand down. Unless um, there's a big exception here, which is that you don't have to signal when circumstances require that both hands be used to safe, safely control or operate the bicycle. So if you don't feel comfortable for taking your hand off the handlebars for 100 feet uh, before a turn or before a stop, then you only have to do it to the extent you feel comfortable. And I know a lot of people who, who don't feel comfortable, um, you know, engaging their brake with one hand while signaling with the other hand. Um, I think a good, a good practice here is to signal your intention to turn, especially uh, if you've got people around you who are looking to you to try to figure out what you're going to do um, and, uh, and do the best you can. Electric bikes. So these are increasingly popular. Um, I've got a, an electric cargo bike that I use to carry my kids around. Um, my, uh, uh, I've got a lot of family members who in the last couple of years have bought electric bikes and it's allowed them to do a whole bunch of uh, longer distance or hillier riding than they would otherwise do or carry kids or groceries or whatever. Um, and it's pretty neat to see. They're really efficient. Uh, and the, the technology has really come a long way. Um, and they're generally speaking subject to the same um, laws as bicycles. There are a few exceptions. Um, in order for it to qualify as an electric bike under Oregon law, it's not supposed to add with its motor power more than 20 miles an hour. So with just the motor power alone, it's not supposed to be able to exceed 20 miles an hour. Um, it is um, not allowed on sidewalks. We talked about that. And you gotta be 16 years old or older to ride an e-bike under Oregon law. Um, this one I think is really uh, unfortunate and antiquated um, given how streamlined um, electric bikes are and how much of an opportunity they open up for kids to get around, especially in hillier areas or um, suburban areas where you're trying to cover more ground. So I hope that that's something that they can take a look at. But um, those are some of the, the main um, rules governing e-bikes that are different from the rules governing bikes. Otherwise, they're pretty much treated uh, as bikes are. You, you got to use the bike lane when there's one available. Um, signaling, all those sorts of things apply to e-bike riding just as they do bike riding. Okay, this is an important statute that um, we have seen um, not complied with and lead to serious injury. Um, and it relates to car doors. So um, a lot of times, unfortunately, uh, the place that you are supposed to ride in the bike lane or um, or on the far right side of the roadway is right next to a row of parked cars. And what can happen is that people open those car doors into the bike lane or into the path of the bike rider and cause a collision. And those collisions can be really nasty because you're hitting a big old piece of uh, metal and glass that's just stopped right in front of you. Um, and so what, what Oregon law says is that the opener of the car door 
is required to uh, look and make sure that the coast is clear before opening the door. Um, and that makes sense, right? They're in a better position to know what, what's going on than the bike rider. Um, so typically liability in those situations is pretty clear. Um, but the person, you know, riding the bike, uh, whenever I'm riding near a row of parked cars, I'm always looking for cues that there might be somebody inside the, the car that might open the door. Um, you know, I feel like Lyft and Ubers and taxis are, uh, frequent offenders of this, um, and just being real defensive and trying, trying not to ride in the door zone if you can, um, if you can avoid it, but it's kind of tough on a road like this, where, as you can see, you got relatively high speed traffic, um, outside of the bike lane to your left. And so it puts, um, puts bike riders in a tough spot. So this one, um, applies, um, in situations where if you're on your bike and you you're riding up to, uh, like a stop sign or a traffic signal, and there's no bike lane and you want to pass all those stopped cars and move to the front of the line. Um, if there's a bike lane there, it's pretty easy. You just cruise up to the front. But um, if there's just a row of idling cars that you want to get around, um, the rule is that you can pass those cars on the right if you can safely do it under the existing conditions, um, which is a pretty, pretty loose uh, standard that basically says uh, you can do it if it's safe. And um, if something bad happens while you're doing it, well, they're probably going to argue that it wasn't safe. So the, the moral here is to do it really carefully, as with most things. Um, drivers passing bicyclists. Um, this one applies. Uh, so, so some states have like a three foot law, which says when you pass bike riders, you got to give them three feet. Um, other states have different measurements. In Oregon, the rule is that if you're passing a bicyclist uh, and they're not in a bike lane and you're on a road with a speed limit above 35, you've got to give them a, enough room to fall over and not hit them. Um, so this applies to roads with relatively high speed with no bike lane, which generally as a bike rider you want to avoid. But uh, sometimes if you're like out in rural Washington County or, or you know, someplace farther out of the city, there's some really nice rural high speed roads that have so few cars that they're enjoyable to ride on. And that's primarily where this applies. Um, if, uh, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't apply the fallover distance, um, then drivers are just required to give a safe distance. Um, but a fallover distance is a pretty um, significant uh, buffer. You know, when I'm riding my bike, I'm probably five or six feet tall, which is quite a, a big, wide berth to give someone. All right. So if, uh, unfortunately, a collision does happen, um, people often wonder, well, what do I do now? Uh, what what insurance do I have that might apply? Um, before we get to that, I'll just mention that if you're out, out on the roadway and a collision happens, um, there's an obligation to stay at the scene and exchange information, um, including uh, name and contact information and insurance information. Um, failure to do that is a hit and run. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's always good to take pictures of, of uh, damage to the scene. Obviously, if you're hurt, it's hard to do all that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, documenting what happened is helpful and certainly getting as much information about the other person, including their uh, name and taking a picture of their license if you can, their license plate, their vehicle, any damage to the vehicle, all that stuff is helpful if you can do it. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of lawyers like me who talk to people for free all the time, even if they're not hurt, if they just, you know, damage their bike. Uh, we're happy to talk with you about 
how to deal with the insurance companies for free. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to, to reach out to a lawyer as soon as you feel like it to get free advice about how to deal with insurers. Because for a lot of people, it is not, fortunately, it is not a process they've been through before. And it is certainly not an intuitive process. And um, lawyers are, are well-versed in, in that world and happy to help. Um, so the question is um, oftentimes, well, what insurance applies to me after a collision? And uh, if, if you as a bike rider have auto insurance, then even if your car is at home in the driveway, um, your auto insurance protects you in the event you get hit by a car. And it provides a couple of different types of coverage. One is called PIP, personal injury protection. That covers your medical bills and your income loss, um, regardless of who's at fault, even if you, the bicyclist, are deemed mostly at fault. Um, another one that's really important is called uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage. And that's there in case the at fault driver who hit you doesn't have insurance or doesn't have enough. You can um, make a claim against your own auto insurance for the damages that the other driver's insurance didn't cover. And that's a good one to take a look at and see if you've got plenty of that um, because there's a whole lot of people driving around without uh, enough insurance. Um, obviously the, the driver's auto insurance is another thing to look at. Um, in Oregon, there's only a requirement that you carry $25,000 in liability insurance, which can be used up pretty quick in a serious injury uh, bike collision. Um, and then if there's no, if there's no car involved then car insurance doesn't come into play. Um, but there is under everyone, everyone's, um, homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance. If you carry it, there is a liability, uh, coverage there. And so, um, that is available to, uh, cover damages that you, that are caused by your negligence. And so if um, you negligently on your bike or while walking cause injury to someone else, which is not as common as um, in car collisions, but it does happen, then there is homeowners or renters liability insurance that could come into play. All right, those are all of the, um, the items that I wanted to cover. And I, I, didn't, um, I didn't monitor the, uh, the chat box or anything, but um, I appreciate you all um, paying attention and um, hopefully you got something helpful out of it. And uh, if there are um, any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. Or if you uh, wanted to follow up with me by, by email uh, or by calling our office, I'd be happy to, um, to talk with you about any questions you might have about bike or pedestrian or scooter law uh, at a later time. So thanks, uh, thanks for having me to uh, Maddie and the Street Trust. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, we um, oh, we had one additional attendee who just left. Okay. Um, um, I, I might ask a couple things if you have a few minutes because sure. I am curious. Yeah. Um, I, well, first of all, the I have to say the the not riding on the sidewalk zone is much bigger than I thought it was downtown. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I tend not to use the sidewalk ever, except to you know get up to park at a bike uh, rack. Um, right. So that was interesting to hear. Now yeah. I've, I've got it memorized from right. the museum to almost to the Amtrak station and yeah. up to Thirteenth. So yeah. do you have a trick for for remembering its boundaries? Well, I. Um... So I, I, I work within the, that zone and, uh, you know, a lot of the streets in downtown are not super inviting to ride on, on a bike. Um, although speeds tend to be lower than, uh, you know, a lot of other wider streets, but, um, I, uh, I feel like I, I tend to feel pretty safe unless I'm like riding with a bunch of like kids or something. Um, and, um, I don't have a trick, but I, I try to be, if I ever do need to ride on the sidewalk for a really short period, um, I, I mean, my preference would be to walk, but if I do have to, for some, some reason, 
um, in technical violation of, or of Portland city law, then I try to just be super respectful. And I see that it does happen um, that people don't know the law and ride on the sidewalk with bikes or scooters downtown. And um, just because of the density, it's, it's so important to be really respectful if you, if you have to. Well, I do have um, one real, uh, well, that was a real question, but um, this one might be more as a, um, a parent and your opinion, if it's a hard one to give a legal answer to, but I've often wondered about um, babies on bikes. Mm -hmm. So I think the Oregon law is technically everyone at 16 and under needs a helmet. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in some states, it's down to age one with um, a specification that no one under one should be on a bicycle. Um, however, I put my baby in a car seat in a trailer and here in Portland where there's so many people with cargo bikes that can easily accommodate car seats, you see a lot of babies on bikes. Yeah. Um, and we all know that a helmet inside a car seat would negate the help that the car seat gives. Right. Um, but to the letter of the law, it doesn't actually apply. I had one friend who ordered um, a play helmet. It's mm. very, very thin for, for toddlers to play in case they bump their head well in a playground. Right. And I, right. I worry that even something like that, if it appeases the law, is mm. bad for in the, the car seat. And I don't know, this is like such a tricky legal area, but I've always yeah. wondered uh, about this, if you don't mind addressing right. it. right. So um, I've ridden with my, um, my now two-year-old when he was in a car seat as an infant. And uh, I put him in a car seat. I strapped him into my cargo bike. And it was, uh, you know, super, uh, super safe uh, and no helmet. Because like you said, there's just no room for it. And that's one of those technical violations. Because in, in Oregon, if you're a rider or a passenger under 16, you're supposed to have a helmet. Um, there's not an exception for infants. Um, but when you think about when that statute would come into play, uh, you know, obviously, uh, if you, what you're really talking about is whether you're going to get a citation for that. Um, because um, otherwise, you're clearly, as, you're, as a parent, uh, doing the best you can to look out for the health of your kid. And so um, I can't think of a situation where a collision would happen and the parent would be faulted for not putting their kid in a helmet that's clearly incompatible with, you know, an infant being in a car seat. Um, in some theoretical claim, injury claim brought by the infant against their parent. Um, so I think what you're really talking about is, is um, you know, a citation. And I would hope that uh, police officer would exercise discretion to realize that a car seat ought to be plenty safe enough um, and not enforce a helmet law in that instance. But I do think it's, it's probably a technical legal violation, unfortunately. Okay. I think yeah. that's what I thought too. Um, yeah. This whole presentation was so fascinating. Um, with the cross bikes and being on the sidewalk and turn signals and everything. Um, and yeah, I think we don't have any questions in the chat. Okay. So um, I will close it up by saying uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you to our sponsors listed on the Sketch conference website. And thank you attendees for coming. Please do enjoy the rest of the summit.